Well, hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, I, I did fly all the way from the Netherlands, and I'm a bit jet-lagged by now, because right now it's uh, uh, quarter to nine in the afternoon for me, or in the evening. Anyway, um, I'm going to be talking about domain-driven design. Before that, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Stefan Kattmanschap. I've been a PHP developer, software developer for over 25 years now. I started back in the days with PHP 3. Anyone remember those days? A couple of people. Yeah, OK, OK, OK. Um, so most of the stuff that I did was with PHP, but I have to admit that uh, not a lot of that was actually with Cake PHP. Uh, the last time I worked with Cake PHP was, I think, version 2, something like that. Uh, so that's a long, long time ago. Um, but uh, uh, since then, I've been, I've been doing, basically, I'm, I'm not sticking to a single framework. Uh, uh, a lot of my work right now is Symfony and Laravel, because that's how the world works at the moment. Um, uh, but I, I, I'll, I'll be happy to do like a plain PHP project as well, just as easy. Um, on several of the projects that I worked on, I've worked with domain-driven design, uh, or something that looks like domain-driven design. Um, and uh, let, let's just start with this. Um, can anyone guess which one is me? No one? Okay. <laughs> ah, no, no, okay. So that's me um, with my uh, fantastic Donald Duck outfit. Um, anyway. Let's move forward. Uh, let's talk about domain-driven design. Um, so this is something that's been becoming more and more popular over the, the past couple of years in, in software development, uh, starting with, uh, uh, I think, mostly Java, .NET, stuff like that, and, and since a couple of years in PHP as well. Um, and because I work as an external contractor from my company, I, I go into a lot of different companies uh, and I, I see a lot of different implementations of domain-driven design. Um, and, the, and the fun thing is, uh, it's, it's, it's very hard to give you one definition of what domain-driven design is, because of all these different ways that people interpret what it is. Um, and so it's also very hard to think of how can I explain this. How can I explain domain-driven design in such a way that it also fits into the time that I've been given? Uh, because domain-driven design is huge. So, uh, for today, I've, I've mostly stuck to the basics, to getting started with domain-driven design. Um, and I won't be talking a lot about code. Um, because there's a, a big part of domain-driven design that is not actually about code, but it is equally important, maybe even more important, than how you actu actually implement it in your code base. Um, so let's start with um, an important note. And that is that domain-driven design is not about software development. Uh, everyone thinks, oh, DDD, that is about software development, right? But it is actually not. Uh, the third D, it says it already, is design. And this is not uh, uh, Photoshop or anything like that. This is designing your code base, designing not even your code base, but the structure, understanding what you're doing. And of course, once you've done that, uh, some of those things will trickle down into your code, and uh, you will see the stuff that you've done before you started coding, and you will see that into, into your code. Um, and, and I'll be talking also a bit, about, a bit about the things that you might see in your code, but not too much. Um, anyway, domain-driven design. It was first introduced by Eric Evans. Uh, he published a book, which these days oops, is called The Blue Book. I wonder why it's called The Blue Book. Uh, the official title is Domain-Driven Design, Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software. And it describes a way of uh, basically modeling software, or maybe need, not even software, modeling the domain of your software. Um, and 
it's not that Eric Evans one day woke up and thought, ah, I have this idea, it's called domain-driven design. No, he's been working on complex software projects for a long time, and basically what he wrote down in this book was uh, uh, a list of the, the things that he found out that really worked well when, working, uh, when modeling the domain, when working with complex problems, complex data structures, etc. Uh, this book is really hard to read. Um, it's, you know, this is not a book that you want to start one day and then try and finish it page by page. Um, because, uh, yeah. There's, it, 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 it's just really, really dry material. Um, so after this was published, uh, uh, Von Vernon uh, thought, well, this is all great, but we need a book that is more practical. And he wrote what is these days called the Red Book. And the Red Book is called Implementing Domain-Driven Design. Uh, and this is more practical. This is actually a book that you can pick up and start reading from start to finish, and you start understanding what domain-driven design is about. Um, the blue book is, is something, if you have the opportunity to get the red book and the blue book, do that, because the blue book is great as a reference material. If you're reading the red book and you don't understand something, find it in the blue book, and then you understand better what the idea behind it is, and then you go back to the red book. Um, so if after, after this session you want to dig more into domain-driven design, uh, then I would definitely recommend at least getting the red book. And if you have the opportunity, get the blue one as well. Okay, so uh, domain-driven design comes from a background of very complex software and complex challenges. And, and this is very important to realize that if you're building the website for uh, the restaurant on the corner, uh, then probably domain-driven design is not for you. Um, Domain-driven design is something that uh, will give you a lot of overhead for a small project. Too much overhead. On the other hand, even if you don't do full domain-driven design, you can still take elements from domain-driven design and use that when you, when you work on your project. So, um, basically, it's a bit like Scrum, right? Nobody ever does Scrum fully by the book, but they pick stuff and use whatever is, is useful, useful to you. Uh, so that, that's basically the same thing with domain-driven design. Don't do it all immediately from the start on every project that you do. And I, I, I started by saying that, in essence, uh, domain-driven design is not about, about software development. So, so let's dig into that a bit more. Um, so I've worked in, uh, in, in software development-related jobs for, for over 25 years now. And uh, the biggest challenge that I found in most of the projects that I worked on is not actually the code. It's not the technical challenges that are the biggest challenge. Uh, uh, the, the biggest problem that I found in most projects is communication. Understanding what we are talking about when we, we, when we talk to each other as developers, but also as a developer talking to a user, or as a developer talking to someone that is a domain expert. Um, and this is where uh, a domain-driven design can really help you in understanding more about what, what are we actually working on? What problem are we solving? Um, and that's, that's why, uh, the, the reason why is uh, because uh, as developers, I'm going to talk for all of us now. As developers, we are really stubborn people. And we always know better. And uh, we always know what to call something. Uh, because we're used to this, and, and uh, the last project, we called it a, a certain word. So in this project, let's call it the same word, because we did it last time as well. But maybe the, the, the actual users, or the business that you're, that you're working for, um, they have a different term for it. They have their own term for whatever you're building. Um, and if you're then talking to each other, and you're talking about one thing, and they're talking about another thing, but it's actually the same thing, but you don't realize that, then you're not building the right solution at some point. You're building something else. So this, this causes a bit of a disconnect. And, and that's what we're trying to solve here. 
So domain-driven design is here to help us solve that problem. Uh, in DDD, we call this ubiquitous language. Ubiquitous language is basically a list of words that we all use with a, with a bit of a definition so that if we use a certain word, then we are all talking about the same thing. That's basically what ubiquitous language is. And that is meant to make it easier for everyone. But that also means that we should all use these words always. We should not invent our own words for it. The words should be used when we write documentation. The words should be used when we talk to our customer or to a user. The words should be used in our code everywhere. And that means that if you give a piece of code that uses that ubiquitous language to someone that is not a developer, they can probably still read and understand what is happening because you're using the same words. The code is now readable. And I really hate saying good code documents itself because no, it does not. But at least it helps that you talk about the same thing. So I've used the term domain a lot because it's part of domain-driven design. Um, let's have a look at the ubiquitous language of DDD itself. Uh, and domain is definitely part of that. Uh, let me first quote Eric Evans on this. He defines the domain in the following way. A sphere of knowledge, influence, or activity, the subject area to which the user applies a program is the domain of the software. So basically, the problem that you're solving. Um, so in general, uh, you can probably explain what the domain is for, for if you build an e-commerce application or if you build some kind of administrative application. You can probably un uh, explain what is the domain of this. It, it, it's a web shop, right? Or, uh, I don't know, a uh, payment system, something like that. Um, the explanation could get a, a bit harder when uh, uh, you're working on a project that is trying to, you know, translate analog business processes into the digital world. Because instead of a paper form, you now have something digital. And uh, you can talk to, to a user that was doing the administration on the paper form and ask them, oh, what did they do? Well, I, I give this form that's been completed and I give it to my colleague and they do something with it and then they do something with it. But it's a bit harder in terms of digital because we don't actually pass on that physical form anymore. So then you have to start translating, okay, so when we, when we used to do this, now we do this. But we talk to the users, what would you call this? I would call it passing it on to someone else, for instance. And of course, a domain is pretty high level, so we can break that down into, into a, a bit more structured stuff. Um, so first of all, you can have a main domain, a web shop, and then you can have subdomains inside that web shop, stuff that belongs together, like um, uh, product display. Products, maybe categories, that's all part of, of the product part, the product subdomain of your web shop. And then there's the checkout flow, which is part of your payment uh, uh, subdomain, something like that. So that basically adds some structure and hierarchy to, to your system. Um, and it is important to note that basically a subdomain is just another domain. It's just part of a hierarchy, but you can still see that as a, 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 this closed off piece of st well, structure. Um, and aside from, from subdomains, there's also the bounded context. And bounded context is part of a, of a domain, and it, it groups a bit together. So if we're talking about um, the, the checkout flow, uh, then there's a couple of different steps that might be seen as things that are uh, um, separate, separate from each other. Um, you can group those together, and then all of that is, the, is your checkout flow. Um, so, like this, for instance, if I have a, a, a web shop domain, and I have a domain with products, I have a domain with checkout, and then I have a bounded context card, and I have a bounded context payment, because these are two different things. 
if you compare this to an actual shop, you'd probably have different staff on the store floor helping you get your products into the cart than you would have uh, uh, doing the payment stuff. That's different people. So this is how you can group together by, by thinking about, you know, what, what makes sense to have together and what makes sense to be separate. Now, I would advise to not uh, add too many layers, add too many subdomains and too many bounded contexts. Start simple, and then at some point you'll realize, okay, maybe this should be separated into two different things. It's always easier to separate something that you've done than to put something together once you've already uh, built separate things. So start simple and bit by bit expand and add more structure. So let's go back to the bounded context. Um, if you have a payment in a bounded context, um, then you're basically always talking about the same thing, right? Um, uh, you're talking about trying to make that payment, trying to create that transaction, get that money into your bank account from, from their credit card or whatever they use. Um, but um, it could be that uh, uh, the, your finance department is talking about something completely different when they talk about the payment, because for them it's more important uh, which, which bank you were using or which credit card you were using, uh, which address information is related to that, to that payment because they also need to create an invoice. Uh, this is less important for the checkout flow, but it's more important for uh, uh, your finance department. So when you have two different bounded contexts, they can both have a payment, but the structure of the payment itself can be really different. It can have different information in your checkout flow than in your, in your finance department flow. Uh, so it's okay to have, uh, to have to use the same term in different bounded contexts, and that might be really something different. There is a point where the one thing has to be translated into the other thing. You can write some code for that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So we've heard about uh, the domain, we've heard about bounded context and, and ubiquitous language. Um, so how do we determine what language to use? Um, now in the blue book, uh, uh, Eric Evans uh, defines something which he calls modeling out loud. And I really like the idea behind this. Uh, basically what happens is you sit down with the, your users, the people from the organization, uh, things like that, and you start asking them what terms they use. And then they start explaining it out loud. And by explaining it, I mean, it, this is like rubber ducking, right? If you're stuck and you try explaining it to someone else, be it a rubber duck or an elephant or a colleague, uh, at the moment that you start explaining it, you already find the solution. And it's the same thing with modeling. When people start explaining what they do every day in their business, they will, they will find the best way of describing that. And especially when you do it with a group and, and, and one colleague says something about what they do and another colleague sits next to them and they say, well, you, you put it like this, but that, but we, we put it like this. And then together you start defining uh, basically your own dictionary, your own ubiquitous language for the project. Um, and you can do, uh, really do this with, uh, uh, not with uh, two or three people, do this with five or 10 people, because the more you do it, the better uh, the definition becomes of your ubiquitous language. Um, and, and let them uh, uh, talk it over a couple of times, not just once. When you have a definition, put it aside for a bit, talk about something else, and then get it back and say, about this, are we still sure about this? There's bound to be someone that says, well, I've been thinking about that, and actually it might be different. So it's good to, to do this exercise a couple of times. Um, another way of doing this is by doing event storming. Um, 
Now, event storming itself is not part of domain-driven design, uh, although it is very tightly coupled to it, because a lot of people that do domain-driven design use event storming. Basically, what you do with event storming is you create the whole flow of your application, or basically the whole flow of your domain, uh, uh, with stickies on a wall somewhere. And you let the users write the stickies, and you have different ways, uh, types of uh, like events and, and uh, things that happen in that flow. Uh, and then at some point, you get to a point where you understand what the flow is. And this is very important to know that before you start coding. Um, how many people have started coding before they even knew what, what you, you needed to code? Yep, most of you. OK. Um, this really helps to understand what you need to do. Um, even if you don't do domain-driven design on your next project, this is definitely something interesting to look at. It doesn't have to be that hard, um, and it can really help you understand the problem more. And then we need to make a map. Uh, and that map is an overview of which bounded contexts we have and about how the bounded contexts communicate with each other. And that's what they call the context map. And in the red book, von Vernon says that you should start with a context map of your current situation. Not where you want to go, but first, where are we now? And then if you want, you can, you can create a second map, and this is where we want to go, and then you can find what is the best way to get there. So, for instance, here's a, here's a, a, a small context map. Um, of the bounded context in the web shop. Uh, so we have a product display, and then we have a, a, a shopping cart, and, and the product display communicates to the shopping cart. Well, the user clicked on this button to add it to the cart, so now add it to the cart. Then the shopping cart, you, you see the shopping cart when you go there, uh, and at some point you click on a button to say, OK, now I want to order this, and then you go to the checkout flow. So then you are in checkout, you make the payment, and at some point, when you made the payment, you confirmed the payment, then it sends something to your inventory uh, uh, context to say, well, this, this was ordered, so you need to take that out of the inventory. Um, but really, when you are at the product display already, you're probably talking to the inventory to see if that product is still in stock or not. So there is a bit of communication happening there as well. And maybe even in the shopping cart, because when I add it to the cart, maybe someone else in the meantime added the last product to, the, to their cart already. Oh, wait. But then it also has to communicate and basically remove it out of your inventory when you add it to the cart. If I look back to when I walk into a store, if I put a product in my shopping cart, it's basically out of the inventory. Not administratively, but no one else can buy it unless they start grabbing the stuff out of my cart, which is a bit rude. Um, so you need, really need to think about this and maybe talk to an expert, a domain expert. Do we need this type of communication? Where do we need to do, add those checks uh, if something is, is in stock or not? So what we've done so far has had nothing to do with the actual code that we write. Um, but what we've done is essential basically to, to uh, create, successfully create code that solves the problem at hand. Because in one web shop, we really need to know if something is sold out the moment we get to the product page. But in other web shops, that might not be necessary because it's a digital project and a product and, and they can do whatever they want. Um, so, we need to put some effort into understanding all of this and talk to people. And if you think, okay, so now we're, we're done with the analysis, we can now start coding. Uh, nope. Um, because I want to talk a bit more about the, the level of detail that we need to do um, to, to understand, you know, what needs to happen. There's a couple of terms that are used, to, so we're going to go back into the ubiquitous language of DDD. First thing is a domain event. Uh, a domain event is something that happens in a process. Uh, 
uh, domain events are always past tense. So for instance, um, someone clicks on uh, 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 add to cart, then the domain event would be product added to cart. Or there would be an event called uh, order confirmation email sent once the email has been sent. So these are events. Then there's aggregates. Uh, an aggregate is basically a, a collection of related domain objects that, that should be treated as a, as a single unit. Um, if we have a web shop, then um, we have an order. And beneath the order, we have order items, which is also a domain object, but an order item by itself is nothing without the order. So the order is the aggregate and the order item below that uh, is part of that order aggregate. And actually the payment might also be part of your order because there's no loose payment. A payment is always related to an order, I hope. Uh, then there's a command and that's something that triggers an event. Um, so uh, for instance, create order. If I have a create order event that would, or a command that would trigger the order created event. And then the order created event, if you talk about actual code, you could have uh, uh, events in your, in your application and something could be listening to an event and do something when that happens. Oh, I would not talk about code, right? Um, so the process of, of modeling and determining these is important and uh, there's a lot more things to define, but uh, let's, let's stick to the basics because I said I would stick to the basics. Um, there's a couple of things that I, I want to mention, like actors. Uh, this is basically who execute a, a certain command, uh, uh, business processes, um, something that processes a command and could maybe create one or even more events. Uh, there's, there's, of course, external systems that you want to define when you create your whole definition uh, that where, where we need to talk to external systems, uh, such as a, the payment service provider in an e-commerce setup. And there's the view, which is basically your template. It's something that an actor can interact with to do something. And, and if, we, if we do all of that, then we, then we understand the basic flow of our application, what we need to actually build. And while I was preparing this talk, I was discussing some of these things uh, and how to explain it uh, uh, with some of my colleagues. And my colleague Jaap at some point said, well, does that mean that software development is just an implementation detail? And yes, actually, this is true. Once you know what you're going to build, then the implementation is just that, implementing what you already defined. So now let's move a bit more to, to, to the implementation. We, we've defined the events, uh, the aggregates, and, and things like that. Uh, we, we had those sessions with our users and the organization, and now we want to move on. Um, now, there's a couple of terms that a lot of PHP projects and frameworks and uh, things use that are eerily similar to the, the names domain-driven design defines but they are actually different. For instance, uh, in, in a lot of ORMs, uh, we are used to having uh, uh, entities, and an entity basically represents something that is in the database. But really, we shouldn't talk about the database yet, because the database is implementation. We're just talking about the domain at this point, and how we store that, how we persist that, whether that's in a database or an external API or a file or whatever, we shouldn't really think about that. So an entity is something that represents a certain domain object, a certain concept in your domain. For instance, oh, sorry, uh, and then not everything needs to be an entity. Sometimes you can also have uh, value objects. For instance, a moment in time. It, it is, a moment in time can be, for instance, uh, a date, uh, but a date already has like a day and a month and a year. Uh, and uh, also a time, which, which has a, a, an hour, a minutes, and, and maybe also seconds. 
And uh, depending on what you're working on, on uh, it might also contain a time zone. So you can create a value object, which is an, easy, an, an object that can very easily uh, be recreated and reused, because it's always the same, right? If, if I have, what is it, uh, um, an object that is for uh, Saturday, 30 September 2023, 12.14, then if I want to use uh, uh, set the date for that specific moment, I can reuse that same object. And another one could be, uh, for instance, a person's name. Uh, the name may have a first name and a last name, uh, but there might also be a, like an infix, I think not in America, but we in, in the Netherlands do that, for instance. Um, uh, we have an infix between the first name and the last name. Uh, and, and some people also have a, a title, like uh, Sir Ian Um So it might be really useful to create a class that represents that, so we can always easily have that, and it's always clear what we're using. This is a name. Uh, this is a person's name. And we can even have that, that class, the actual code, have different methods to format. Because in some situations, you may need only the initials and the last name, and in other situations you might need the full name and the last name. So you might have different methods to format that. And your entities and value objects should be named according to the ubiquitous language, if that wasn't clear enough yet. Um, we defined those names already, we should use those names to, so, so that it is always clear what we're talking about to everyone. So looking at this in uh, a slightly more practical way, uh, how do we implement uh, the separation between the database logic and the domain entities? Because now we actually have two entities. We have the entity that actually represents something in the database, and we have the entity from our domain. Now these could be two completely different uh, classes in your code, uh, which makes sure that you have a, a, a really good separation of concern. Uh, but it also makes sure that you have to write a lot of code because you have to keep uh, uh, moving from one to the other and back all the time, which is really hard. Uh, so another approach you could do is to define an interface in your domain layer instead of an actual class. And the interface defines the, the domain object, basically, and then your entity, uh, um, uh, your entity imp implements that interface. And now your domain is not actually a class, it's just an interface but you can still type hint on that interface and you are always sure that that is the object that you have. Um, so the first approach with two separate classes is, uh, uh, is you know, really pure in terms of domain-driven design, um, but it might be impractical for, for smaller projects. If you have a huge project, it's not that bad, but if you have a small project, it's going to take you a lot of extra time to build something. Now, there's a lot of, uh, um, uh, lot of different frameworks that have services, basically. Uh, and a service in a lot of PHP projects is a bit of a, a weird thing. It could be anything, right? Because if you have a, a dependency injection container or a service container, then everything in there is a service, right? Um, and in, uh, in domain-driven design, um, we, you, you try to not do that because you want more clarity in your code uh, and you want it to reflect your domain. Um, so when you have a service, it should not be anything that has some logic in it. You can add more structure to your code uh, and um, make it clear what that code does. So let's, let's get back to that, that web shop example. Um, if we have a bounded context orders, and, and then we have an entity for the order, and we have order lines, etc. cetera. Um, but we also have a bit of code that, that processes that order, including sending it to our external accounting software. Um, and I could add that code that con con uh, connects the external service in, uh, into a service class. Uh, so I could create a, a directory and a namespace called services, and put a class there, uh, um, uh, but again, that, that services, the, the term service doesn't really tell me much about what is happening there. So instead of 
calling that namespace services, I could also call that the order processing namespace. Now, whenever I open the code, I immediately know what is in there instead of this weird services thing, what is in there? I don't know. Order processing, I know exactly what's happening there. That's about the code that does the order processing. So I could call it the order processing service uh, in, in the order processing uh, namespace. Um, and I can, I can put every, everything there, but I could also just remove that, that, that service in order processing service. I could just name the class the order processor. That's more clear. It communicates directly what is happening in that code. Now, the most important thing here is that everyone does the same thing. So in your team, you have to make some rules or guidelines or standards or whatever you want to call them. This is how we name our classes. And then everyone does it. If that means you all use the, the service postfix, sure, fine. But not have one person use that and another person not use that. That will be confusing. So um, we mentioned domain events earlier. Uh, how, how can we incorporate that in our project? Um, these days, there's, there's a lot of uh, event-driven uh, code. You can, you can trigger an event and have another piece of code that actually processes that event and does something. Um, and this is actually how you can use domain events as well. Your domain events uh, are basically the same as, as the, your, your events in the code. Um, so if we have the order processor that we had earlier, um, uh, then we, we would have defined like an order sent to accounting domain event. So when the order processor is done, it sends that event. And then we know, okay, our external system now has the order and we can do whatever needs to be done after that has happened, uh, like sending out an email or something. Um, and we can uh, create listeners. And if you use an event-driven system, this is also great because uh, the bounded contexts that we defined earlier, they should not just use each other's code because they're you know, these isolated grouped parts of pieces of code. Um, but if you use events, then uh, uh, one bounded context can, can uh, trigger an event and the other bounded context can be listening to those events. And they would have no knowledge about each other aside from the fact that, that there is this event and that's happening and now I need to do something. Um, and now, I mentioned earlier about the entities, which is a bit uh, uh, um, uh, uh, confusing sometimes because there's, there's entities in your, in your uh, database abstraction layer and entities in the domain. We have a similar thing with repositories. In an ORM, the, the repository uh, uh, is, is used to fetch data uh, from, from, from a database, basically. Um, and uh, uh, in a DDD, uh, the repository, well, it does have the, the responsibility to allow for the loading of, of aggregates, basically. Um, but where uh, in a database abstraction layer, you would usually have a repository for, for basically for every entity. Uh, in, in DDD, you basically only define one repository uh, for every aggregate. Because you don't, need a, uh, you don't need to fetch individual order lines on a domain level. Maybe on a, on a database level, sure, but on the, on the domain level, you, you load an order. And that order returns the order, the other order lines related to that, the payment related to that. Uh, and that's, that's what it does. So there's a slight difference there also in understanding the, the repository and the entity in, in our database abstraction layer is very, very much connected to each other. Uh, and in, in DDD, we talk about aggregates and repositories and, and not about entities and repositories. So there's a lot more to cover about the domain-driven design, uh, but I think we covered the basics right now. Uh, and, and I realized that this is very overwhelming. There's a lot of information and, and this is even just the bare basics. There's a lot more. Um, so uh, uh, I, would, I would recommend uh, uh, looking at uh, your next project uh, if you think 
let's apply DDD to not apply everything at once. Start with the small pieces and then bit by bit start introducing a bit more. Um, use whatever your framework, CakePHP in your case, offers you uh, because there's a lot of stuff in there already uh, that can help you. Um, and then there's a lot of other things that you might look at at some point in the future, not right now, like a hexa hexagonal architecture that will help abstract your actual domain code from your, uh, 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 your implementation or your, your framework code. Uh, and things like CQRS that, that separates basically read and write from each other, which is also something that's related a lot to domain-driven design. Um, digging into everything, digging into this, it, it can feel like you're going down a rabbit hole and, and you, you won't get out anytime soon uh, because there's so much information in there. But I really would recommend to be um, um, careful with things like CQRS or even event sourcing uh, because it's, it's things that you will find when you look more deeply into domain-driven design, but they can really kick you in the, in the butt as well. So really watch out when implementing that. Shouldn't do that every time. And to reiterate, of course, uh, if you want to dig into DDD more, get that red book. The red book, not the blue book. Well, you can get the blue book as well, but that's a reference material. The red book is the one that you want to read. Uh, there's a couple of more places where you can see, like, there's a couple of blog post articles. Uh, uh, the PHPCC, which is a company from Germany, uh, with Sebastian Bergman from, uh, from PHP Unit. Uh, they, they wrote, on their website, they wrote a couple of things about DDD. Uh, Matthias Nobach, Dutch person, yay. Uh, he... Um, uh, wrote some interesting blog posts about DDD with, with PHP. Um, there's, a, there's a book on LeanPub, Domain Driven Design in PHP. Uh, I haven't actually read it yet, but uh, from what I hear, it's, it's actually pretty good. Um, and and there's, there's so much more. Um, so there is a link. I'm going to show it first. This is the link. It links to most of those resources. Uh, so if you want to take anything from this talk, just take this link. <laughs> and you will find more resources about digging into domain-driven design. Any questions? I was going to say, like, uh, when do you decide how far down the domain-driven design path you're going to go? Because like, you can go into event sourcing and CQRS and like, all of that kind of stuff. How, how do you decide how big an application or how complex a domain is before, like, before you go up to like level five of yeah I mean okay so side. how how to decide uh, how to decide how far to go is basically the question um, so uh, as I mentioned before basically what I try to do usually is uh, start as simple as possible and then along the way you will find out okay this is too complex to 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 solve in this simple way now we have to split it up uh, and and the same basically goes for that as well. Unless, of course, you already know that you're going to build the next uh, bank or something like that, then then you can start immediately with 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 a lot of the, the, this stuff. Uh, but unless you're building a bank, uh, probably you want to start simple, and then along the way you'll figure out, okay, so maybe it's now a good good idea to to separate that or or to now apply CQRS or event sourcing. Um, event sourcing really. Uh, uh, because I've seen this happen. Um, event sourcing, I, I haven't really explained what it is. I'm not going to do that now. Um, but if you use event sourcing, use it only on parts of your application, not on your whole application, because that will become a big mess and you really don't want that. Uh, so that's a word of caution. Any more questions? Yeah, in front. One oh, moment. Wait for the mic. How do you convince the client that's important? Sorry? How do you convince the client that this is important? How, how do you, okay, so um, I think, so what happens in a lot of projects, uh, in IT in general and, and in PHP specifically, is that uh, um, what is being delivered is not what the client actually wants. It's what they might think they want at some point but it's not what they actually want. So if you, you can convince them by saying, 
uh, we want to take a bit more time first to figure out what you actually need. Uh, and then once we've done that, well, the, again, the, actually developing it is just an implementation detail. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of work, but then at least we know what we're all talking about. Um, I think it, it's really hard to find any client that hasn't already experienced getting something that they didn't actually want. So, yeah, it should be, and of course not every client will agree, uh, because uh, they think, oh, this might make it more expensive. But it's like writing unit tests. If you don't write unit tests, at first you're going really fast. And then at some point you're going to hit all the bugs, and then it's going to take a long time to, f to finish that last 20%. And it's a similar thing with this. If you, at first, you're going to go really fast if you don't take the time to actually define what you're building, because you're just building something. Uh, but at some point, you're going you're gonna to hit this, this point where the customer says, well, this is not what I actually want. And then you're going to spend a lot of time, and therefore their money, to fix that. So that's, I think that's, that's the best way to try and at least try and convince the customer. Yeah. Any more questions? No more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you.